It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization, to this session of the Web Symposium organized by the Government of Kerala on the subject, Kerala, the Development Path Ahead. The subject, of course, is deeply marked by the fact that we are discussing it in the time of COVID-19. Dr. Swaminathan is a pediatrician and an internationally recognized clinician and researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. She brings with her three decades of experience in clinical care and research. And throughout her professional career, she has sought to translate research into impactful programs. Before she became WHO's Deputy Director General for Programs in 2017, she was Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research, and then she was Director General of the Indian Council for Medical Research. She was appointed the World Health Organization's first Chief Scientist, a newly created position with a wide-ranging remit to strengthen the WHO's core normative work in several ways. Welcome, Dr. Swaminathan, to this web symposium. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ram. And indeed, it's an honor and a great privilege to be having this conversation with you. Um, you've interviewed so many world leaders and famous people uh, in your career as a journalist. So it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, may I start with uh, uh, w what seems to be WHO's um, current reading of the situation? that you're not going to be able to eradicate the virus. Uh, you, you will have to manage around it. Uh, it's going to be with us for a long time, but you can do a lot to contain it, live with it. Perhaps uh, the trajectory will be from pandemic to epidemic to endemic. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, that impression, Dr. Swami? The first thing I'd like to say is that we're learning a lot about this virus and so each week we understand more and more and therefore our, uh, our thinking about it and also the projections that we're able to make uh, do change and in fact I think it's it's one of those things where in science it's very common you know as you make advances um, scientists do debate and question each other and then that's how knowledge advances but for the public I think it's probably a new experience to have all of this debate happening out in the, in the public domain. But it's, it's very normal for science. Now, this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 belongs to a family of coronaviruses that we have known for a long time. And prior to this one, there, there are six other coronaviruses that actually infect humans. Bats and some other animals actually have hundreds of coronaviruses that infect them, that don't do any harm. And we think this also came from the bat. But what we know now about this virus is that firstly, firstly, it's much more infectious than the two other previous serious coronavirus infections we've seen. The SARS in 2002-03 and then the MERS, uh, which was later uh, during this past decade. Now, SARS was completely contained and disappeared actually. Uh, because of the, the measures that were taken and possibly because it was much less infectious and transmissible. Whereas MERS continues to cause episodic outbreaks, even though countries have learned how to deal with it and keep it at a low level. This virus we've seen has spread extremely quickly. It's spread around the world. It's now present in almost every country in the world. And of course, it's caused major outbreaks uh, leading to a significant amount of, uh, of death and morbidity. It appears that this virus will stay with us um, because of, the, of the, the spread and the transmission that has occurred over the last few months. And, and we're still watching it. We're watching the genetic mutations. We're watching it to see how it's behaving. And so far, it's doing like any other coronavirus. It changes a little bit like all RNA viruses do. But the good thing is it hasn't changed its structure in those major domains at which drugs and vaccines are going to be targeted. So I think to sum up, it's likely that this virus will stay with us um, for a long time. 
it will have to be managed in one way or another right now we are using these public health measures to contain it and to mitigate the damage hopefully we will have a vaccine which will definitely help building up uh, immunity and then just like human kind is now living with many many viruses perhaps this will become one more uh, but a manageable one smallpox was eradicated from the face of the earth it was a it took a very long time to do it uh, that, that was true eradication was we are not talking about yes. any so smallpox is the only human dis disease to have been eradicated viral disease um and of course we hope polio will be the next we get close to it and then we get some setbacks but that's still the global goal to eradicate polio at this stage i think it's very premature to talk about eradication of this virus the sars cov 2 virus i think we we must think first about reducing the impact it's having on people in terms of deaths and and illnesses and being and for ministries of health and public health officials to be able to manage it so that it's not having this this disastrous impact i think that's that's the goal in the near future and then of course once we have a vaccine or more than a one vaccine we can think about protecting a large part of the population particularly the vulnerable groups um and, and that actually cuts transmission once you develop immunity in the population what is called herd immunity then it actually cuts the transmission of the virus from person to person that comes from uh, va vaccines and also by the in the natural course of the infection spreading uh, herd immunity yes it could it could but generally the the word herd immunity is referred to of course it comes you know from the animal kingdom from cattle uh, management and the concept is that you protect your herd and you are willing to sacrifice individual animals you know but in this case i think we can't exactly take the same uh, uh, yes. meaning so when we talk about herd immunity for diseases like measles and so on what we mean is that if you immunize 95% of the population then it protects even the 5% who are unimmunized because the virus cannot move from person to person so that's what we hope to achieve but i think the way we're going to get there is through a vaccine in this case not through cycles of this kind of disastrous natural infection i have heard this virus uh, this, uh, this virus being characterized as very dangerous and no not dangerous at all others because uh, it's well known that the uh, case fatality rate is quite low uh, and also age groups uh, it varies according to age groups um at the same time it it has had a bigger impact than anything present uh, memory uh, how, where would you put that the uh, the, the danger indicator uh, if you like the who i think recently they said it's a very dangerous epidemic i heard that heard that uh, from who and and yet people doctors and others tell me no no this is no big deal uh, because uh, you can live with it yes i think this is one of the one of the paradoxes and probably is confusing to people we do know that the large majority of people uh, about 80% will have mild or moderate symptoms and will recover from the uh, illness without much of uh, any significant uh, morbidity we also know there are number of people who are almost asymptomatic who don't even know that they've had the infection and how do we know this we know it because of the serological surveys that have been done in some countries where they take a random sample of the population and test them to see if they have antibodies which shows that they've been exposed to the virus so we know many more people actually are infected in the community uh, compared to the number who get sick and show up in hospitals so that is an encouraging thing because then you know okay a large proportion are not going to really suffer much however the people who get sick are getting really sick and of course it affects more the vulnerable the elderly the people who have other illnesses pre-existing illnesses however it's it doesn't spare the the young and the fit and we've seen now in the last few months many many cases of relatively young and healthy people also succumbing to this and recently there have been some concerning reports about children having a strange inflammatory syndrome which seems to be an immune reaction to this virus it could be still investigating that so it's not 
a dangerous pathogen like Ebola, which kills, kills two thirds of people that it infects. But Ebola doesn't spread so easily from person to person. In this case, because it's infecting millions of people around the world, even that small proportion of dangerous illness is a significant number of people. And that's why we say this is a dangerous pathogen because of this property that it has to infect huge numbers and then really make a, a, a small proportion of them very, very sick. And we have to, that's why we have to take it seriously. What would you say about uh, transmiss the transmission of this? Uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a complex subject, isn't it? How it transmits. Uh, I, I heard that they, they say, uh, you know, there are some people who can be called super spreaders. Perhaps it depends on the stage of the infection. I don't know. So what, what does science tell us about that? This is a very rapidly moving field again. And what I say today, you know, will be, have to be corrected probably in a few weeks or months. But what we know now is that this virus spreads through droplets. So when we are coughing, sneezing, or even speaking loudly, there are small droplets that come out and that can travel, you know, up to six feet, let's say. So if you're in conversation with a person uh, and if that person coughs, you could have, um, or even talks loudly or sings, you could have those droplets actually coming onto your face. So most of the transmission is through this kind of a contact between people. And that's why particularly in crowded settings, uh, this is why virus transmission depends not only on the property of the virus, but also on the setting in which humans are interacting. And we've seen the big outbreaks that have occurred around the world have been in mass gatherings, in football stadiums, in churches, in mosques, in music concerts, you know, where you mentioned super spreaders. So one of the uh, pieces of data that's coming out now, it appears that there are some people who are highly, highly infectious uh, compared to a majority of others who are not so infectious. We need to be able to know how to identify them. But it, uh, it's true that some people are more infectious. We also know the infection. Infectiousness is most just a day or two prior to the development of symptoms to a day or two right after. So this makes it very challenging because even before someone is sick, they could be transmitting. And that's the uh, logic behind many governments now advising people to wear masks when they go out, particularly when they know they're going to be in a crowded place. So that even if you may be asymptomatic and having, a, having the virus in you, you prevent it from, from uh, going out. The, even ordinary cloth masks you know, can reduce to a significant uh, amount the aerosol coming out. We know now that the, the role of fomites may be less. In the beginning, we said, you know, objects carry this virus and we could get it by touching objects. So we still need to be cautious and wash our hands regularly after we go out or, or touch things outside. But it appears that the virus may not be surviving for that long on surfaces, as we had thought. And the main mode seems to be through this droplet direct uh, transmission. So on mass, uh, I read there was an open letter signed by a very large number of scientists, including Nobel laureates, that uh, it's now proven. Science has established that uh, mass, that in the case of COVID-19, masks uh, are hugely beneficial. Whatever kind of mask, uh, do you endorse that? Yes, uh, you know we have to be uh, careful because when we talk about masks, you have of course the the N95 masks which healthcare workers need to wear when they are in close, uh, when they're dealing with patients who have COVID. So we need to reserve those for those frontline workers. And what happened at the beginning of this outbreak is the entire supply chain of the world basically broke down and there wasn't enough PPE, personal protective equipment available for healthcare workers. Um, so WHO very strongly said at that time that all of this equipment should be reserved for healthcare workers. They are at highest risk and need to be protected. But later on, as our knowledge evolved, we, we did realize that transmission could uh, be slowed by wearing masks, either ordinary surgical masks or even homemade cloth masks. Two or three layers is better than one and two different fabrics is better. So if you combine cotton and nylon or cotton and silk, it, it gives you a better protection and it does reduce. Everyone has to wear it though, that's the thing. To be effective, uh, masking has to become universal. And we've seen in many countries of Southeast Asia that it's a, 
culturally acceptable for people to wear masks well before this. I think it started after the SARS outbreak. And those countries have been able to control COVID-19 better. And it might have something to do with the universal culture of wearing masks when people go out. Now, if I may turn to a subject which you have emphasized, WHO and you, the chief scientists, have been emphasizing very, very strongly. Test, test, test. Do you still hold with that? Is this still your uh, advice? Yes. yes. <laughs> and you have also been quoted in earlier interviews as saying some countries are not testing enough. It's far too low. So the reason why, you know, we need to emphasize testing is that is the only way of knowing where you are, where the infection is in your population and what you need to do and where you need to act. So it's like um, fighting, um, trying to fight a fire with a blindfold on. You know, if you don't know where the fire is, you don't know where to go. So you can't fight it blindfolded. And testing is the only way right now. To, to do that. Now, there are different kinds of tests which can be used for different purposes. The molecular test, which actually goes and looks for the viral RNA, what's also called the RT-PCR test, it is complex, it is difficult to do. Many countries did not have the capacity to, to really ramp it up. But that's the only way of finding if somebody is really infected with the virus. There are more newer generation tests in development. Hopefully, we'll get some rapid antigen tests soon that will be able to do that much more easily and quickly. But for now, we use the RT-PCR to do that. You know where your infection is, you know that person needs to be isolated, that their contacts need to be uh, tested and so on. Um, then you also have the blood antibody tests, which actually tell you that you've seen a particular virus, you've been exposed, your body's developed antibodies. You may or may not have been sick. Now, when you do that at the population level, you get to know uh, how much of your population actually was exposed and has immunity now? Or we can presume that they have immunity. So New York City, for example, they did this survey among about 3,000 people, randomly selected, and they found about 20% uh, of them had antibodies. Interestingly, they also found a gradient, uh, socioeconomic gradient, with the highest positivity being in those people, uh, African Americans and Latinos who lived in the most crowded neighborhoods. So such an exercise will help any country to know how widespread the infection is and where it's most acute and where your actions really need to be focused. That is why testing is important, both for the individual to take care of that person and their family, but also for the uh, epidemiologists um, and public health experts to understand where this disease and it's spreading and how it's spreading. So what do you say is of tremendous relevance to India when you talk about uh, different socioeconomic strata, how, how it affects? Uh, so it becomes all the more important. Yes. And I think there are plans in India now to do this kind of testing. Uh, the ICMR was talking about a nationwide zero survey, but individual states could also plan to do that, particularly to know in their hotspot areas. And as you said, to see even within cities, where is this infection actually concentrated? I'll come to Kerala in a little bit because it's, uh, it seems to be all a, a special case in, in India and there's quite an international uh, uh, literature on it. Now, one uh, finding, looking at data, maybe very limited finding, is that uh, if, you t if you test early when the number of cases is small, uh, and do the rest of it, uh, what uh, WHO has recommended, test, uh, isolate, um, contact trace, and support. Support can only be, uh, I suppose, symptomatic and, you know, there's no real treatment. If you do that, uh, countries which have done that have, you also spoke about it, have done uh, much better than other countries. Uh, I, I would say the state of Kerala in India has done that, although it tested more than any other state in the first 24 days. Uh, the cases were identified. Not a whole deal, not a great deal of testing, I must say, but uh, more than other states. Maybe that's a factor. But, uh, but there's more evidence from other country, from countries, South Korea and so on. 
Okay. Yes, it's true that uh, those countries who took note, you know, of the warning early on, the public health emergency of international concern was declared on uh, January 30th. And um, many countries, including India, took note of that and, and put in place measures. In fact, I think um, Kerala had put in place measures before that. They started even in early January and therefore they were able to identify the first few people who came back from Wuhan and then were able to take the appropriate steps. So once you identify, then of course you have to trace all the contacts. There were hundreds and thousands of contacts who were traced and um, being, they were isolated. Then there was institutional quarantine facilities for those who could not isolate themselves at home. And all of those steps were put in place very quickly. And, and that's why I think the, the, the amount of testing that they did, but also the subsequent actions that needed to be taken were done uh, very thoroughly. And they were able to contain the infections. Now they're seeing a second uh, wave of cases as there are uh, Malayalis from all over the world actually returning from, both other from, from, from other outside, states. from other states and from other countries. People, unfortunately, who've lost their jobs or coming back and some of them are bringing the infection with them. So it is a big challenge now for uh, all these states, including Kerala, to really be able to identify and do the same actions they did at the beginning. But um, that can only be done at the beginning. You know, once there's widespread community transmission, it is actually quite difficult then to contain. And then you need to move into mitigation measures that, that try to keep the situation, you know, under, under control. I was speaking to Dr. Iqbal just before this, uh, to prepare myself for the Kerala part. Um, uh, he's the chair of the... Uh, expert committee on the control of uh, COVID-19 in, in the government of Kerala. Uh, very senior, he's a neurosurgeon um, who heads this. And he was telling me that uh, according to him, the key thing for, behind Kerala's success, they're quite modest actually, they still say there's uh, challenges, uh, is uh, quarantine the, they, and, co and contact tracing. Uh, mm. They said also uh, reverse quarantine where they protected the elderly population. Uh, testing, he said, came, it wasn't that easy to get kits and so on early, but still the figure, the data show that they did more than other states. But he was saying that the real success was people cooperating with this, quarantine and uh, contact trace. Apparently, I don't think anyone else has achieved uh, 100 uh, 100 contacts through tracing for one person infected, that kind of figure. So, so, he, so he was trying to put it, give me a perspective on what, what worked, apart from the well-known historical and socio-economic factors Kerala is noted for. But I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, on the science itself. Ah. Okay, if I can come to Kerala then, the Kerala story, which is fairly well known because uh, there's an international literature on it. It was the, first, it was the state with the first recorded case, cases of COVID-19, came from Wuhan, the students, initially led other Indian states in the number of confirmed cases. Uh, the government was very proactive. It had experienced Nepal and uh, earlier. Um, they deployed uh, what has often been called an airtight health protocol and simultaneously came up with a comprehensive economic package by about 20,000 crores. Package. And they were able to keep the mortality rate very low. I think up to today, I saw in their dashboard nine deaths, rate about zero. Uh, the case fatality rate is about uh, 0 0.77 for Kerala and so on, although there's, there's still a challenge. As far as I can see, as a lay person, they, they gave uh, more assurances to the people. I, won't, I don't want to go into details. You know it uh, pretty well. No one would go hungry and without a safety net of essential commodities and services. 
So every agency and arm of the government, backed by armies of volunteer citizens, worked hard to deliver on. Secondly, nobody would go without shelter. This, I think, benefited the migrant workers. It was a model for other states on how to deal with this problem. Thirdly, everyone would have access to the health system, free tiers, as needed. And I think uh, you can say the government followed the WHO guidelines uh, scrupulously, test to the extent they had the kids, isolate, contact rate, and also support. And free testing was part of Kerala's safety net. So as I said, early in the first 24 days, their test rates were higher than for other states. And then fourth, you've also been emphasizing it, I think WHO and you, continuous, free and continuous flow of information on her from the top. And it really is uh, all about the relationship of citizen and the state with its citizens. So uh, wh how would you read the Kerala model uh, or the Kerala experience thus far? They're not, I think they're not being complacent. They're being... Uh, they're very concerned about the, uh, the, the current challenges, the, the increase and, and so on. Uh, but how would you read that? I have the latest figures. Uh, 1,208 confirmed cases. Uh, and uh, yeah, about 50 tests per confirmed case. Mm -hmm. Karnataka has a better average, 91 tests per confirmed case, but the rest of India is very low. So how do you, what can we learn from Kerala? And can this be some kind of model for other states and even other regions and other countries? I think what you've just uh, described really highlights the elements of a good response to to any disaster, you know, whether it's a natural disaster or an outbreak of an infectious disease. And uh, we've seen over the last few years that Kerala actually has been challenged by first the Nipah virus. Uh, the next year, again, there was a scare and then there were floods. And then they, they were the first state to actually get a case of uh, COVID-19. So I think the elements that you described actually are because of the investments that have been made in public health and in education over the last several decades. And that actually has paid off. And those, I think, starting with leadership, you know, you need to see leadership and the way the Kerala Health Minister took leadership, you know, of course, backed by the, by the Chief Minister, but she took leadership right uh, in each of these uh, uh, episodes that they've had over the last few years. And she was seen to be leading from the front. And, and of course, was backed by a group of experts, strong public health officials and bureaucrats who, who did it. The other element is, I think, the, uh, the decentralization of decision making and the strong local government bod bodies that they have and the involvement of the Panchayati Raj institutions and people's participation in decision making. And again, that's something that has been in place for a long time. And therefore, I think that the trust that gets built up locally between the community and the public health officials, I think really gets tested at times like this, when, when you're being faced with this unprecedented crisis and you're being told to do things that you've never done before. So you have to have that trust and belief that it's being done for the right reasons. The third, I think, is the multi-sectoral and rather comprehensive approach that's needed to tackle these things. You see, a pandemic is not just a health issue and cannot be tackled by the Department of Health alone. It is impacting in huge ways people's lives, their livelihoods. The whole social fabric is threatened. In fact, we don't like to use the word social distancing anymore because of the implications it has. It's physical distancing we want. We want society to actually come together to help each other. So that kind of a multi-sectoral approach where you take care of people's other needs, whether it is food or whether it is shelter uh, or whether it's some amount of monetary assistance. And we saw that during the floods as well, how 
community members and volunteers came forward really to to support the administration um and that again is a very unique uh, feature i think that was seen because there was that reciprocal relationship uh, built I, i think over over a long time and also because of a lot of social capital a lot of investment in in those institutions like kudumbashree and other uh, uh, you know community based organizations so i think for uh, it's it's and of course then it was backed by data and by um, robust public health uh, principles and and action so just i would just like to say that looking ahead looking forward what more could be done actually to strengthen not just in kerala but i think in india and in many other developing countries which are in the same state it's clear that you need investments in public health and and education but staying sticking with public health for now unless we have systems in place that are able to detect an event that occurs unusual events that occurs unless you have people trained in epidemiology and public health action who are actually available at the district level who can take action and find out what's happening the outbreak investigations unless you have data systems that can then flow up you know and that give you uh, accurate data uh, on what is happening laboratory networks that can do different kinds of tests and most important i think a public health cadre and a directorate of public health within each of the um departments of uh, health that that state governments have i think only a couple of states in india have a director of public health and a public health service but you can see the difference it makes uh, in those states tamil so nadu. it's not yes tamil nadu is one of them it's not only about responding to these outbreaks it's actually taking preventive action and being prepared and we know today that health is determined by many many uh, determinants and factors risk factors and that health is not something that is uh, a curative uh, the focus for long has been on curative services but we really need to now think about the determinants which are things like safe water sanitation housing air uh, air pollution uh, nutrition the use of tobacco and alcohol uh, and very important also mental health these are all the things that determine whether you live a healthy and productive life or not and a department of public health and preventive medicine would have an opportunity to focus on those elements which may actually need action in other departments so you may have to take fiscal action on say increasing tobacco tax or you may need the environment department to actually take action on reducing uh, air pollution uh, or, or provision of safe water but unless the health people are leading this effort with a, with a strong rationale for why it's important it's unlikely that these other actions will ever get taken by other departments so i hope that one thing that countries have learned from this pandemic is the need to invest in public health and preparedness um, and we've seen that even in the most high income countries that it's it's just fallen apart the the, the health system was not able to to cope so i think a lot of lessons for for everyone from this Uh, next of course everyone would be interested in your views on where are we in vaccine development uh, and also it involves uh, equity there is vaccine nationalism that i want my vaccines uh, once it's developed that's the first challenge how will it be made available to people who need it uh, in a reasonably equitable and fair way Uh, where are we exactly. where are we on on the first issue uh, vaccines so you're absolutely right so there are two challenges here one is the research and development that needs to be put in place to develop a vaccine as soon as possible to accelerate it as much as possible and the other is to uh, make sure that the vaccine is actually going to be available for people regardless of their ability to pay and so for who it's re- the the access part is is really key for us and uh, we we are not interested in a situation where there are vaccines but they're only available to a few people in the world and so we've come together now with many different agencies around the world and i must say that there's been a huge amount of global collaboration and solidarity around the this particular uh, theme of access 
to COVID technologies, uh, whether they are therapeutics or vaccines or newer generations of diagnostics. So we've launched what's called the ACT Accelerator with our partners, which hopes to not only accelerate the research and development, but also in a way that you know, we show that these vaccines are going to be available. This, of course, requires a lot of investment in terms of uh, funding, not just for the R&D part, but also for the advance commitments and the procurement that's going to be needed of hundreds of millions of doses. And, uh, and the second thing is, how do you reduce the timelines? You know, traditionally, it would take, if not 10 years, at least five years to develop a vaccine for a new disease. Here today, we're in a situation where there are already 10 vaccines in clinical trials, you know, within four months of a new virus being discovered. So science has made enormous progress because of genetic sequencing technologies. We were able to know about the virus right on January 11th when the Chinese scientists made it public. And within 24 to 48 hours, several labs had actually uh, developed these uh, uh, vaccine uh, constructs which could then start getting developed. And we have now, as I said, 10 candidates in, tr in trials and many, many more, over 200 candidates in development. So that's the good thing. We can be hopeful that these variety of different uh, types of vaccines that people are trying, right from inactivated viruses to protein subunits to very new platforms like DNA and RNA vaccines, would some of them hopefully will be successful but at the same time, we need to run it through very rigorous clinical trials and testing to make sure that not only are they efficacious, but that they are safe and that they pass the minimum regulatory standards. And so we can compress some timelines there, but we still need to go through that testing. Where we can save time is by investing in manufacture ahead of knowing about the efficacy of these vaccines. And so that's where a large amount of funds are now being raised so that you can invest manufacturing in manufacturing capacity so that as soon as you get the results of clinical trials, the company can manufacture large volumes. Realistically speaking, I think we may have, we will have results from these trials uh, in the next uh, few months and some of them will go into the larger phase three clinical trials. And perhaps by the end of the year, there may be some results and some vaccine doses available. Um, but in order to get the, the hundreds of millions of doses that are going to be needed, we're looking at 2021 and 2022 to be able to vaccinate large numbers of people. So what we hope countries will agree to do is to pool resources and also to agree to share equitably the available vaccine doses as they become available. And we should have a consensus on whom do we want to protect first. And if it's healthcare workers, so be it, you know, the elderly or people with other diseases, but it would be good to get a global consensus on that. So that even if you have a small pot to begin with, you share that uh, uh, equitably. This model, we also launched on Friday, a, a technology access pool where we're encouraging both countries and industry, private sector to pool the the, their technologies, vaccines, therapeutics, and other technologies for this disease so that it can be scaled more quickly and that, again, there can be equitable access to these products. If this model works, then I think it may be relevant for other diseases where there is very little investment in, uh, in R&D but which affect human beings and cause a lot of suffering or, or death. And I can think of many other diseases like that where we need this kind of... Uh, coming together globally and doing something for the for the public good. In this area, the WHO will be expected to not only coordinate, but lead the uh, whole effort. And I'm sure uh, I wish you the yes. best. Before we close, Dr. Swaminathan, would, would, I have a thought here, on which I would advise you to comment. Um, there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation that's been written about, it's been called an info pa pandemic and so on. In the, um, but uh, what stands out for me is, it does appear that uh, people rely on science now. Uh, COVID-19, this pandemic has provided an opportunity 
for uh, the upgrading of science in this country. That science, you know, people trust science. They are doing a lot of things that you recommend are based on science. Uh, would that be one of the major, I would say, even gains from this? How, how would you, as a, as a sir, chief scientist of WHO, what would be your thought on where, where science is? Uh, 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 Dr. Venki Ramakrishnan has addressed this question at least briefly how science changes and so on. But what would you say uh, sitting at the headquarters? I agree. I mean, I sitting in this position here as chief scientist, I really never thought that, you know, we would become the center of, uh, of all of the discussions globally around uh, something like this. But um, it's true. I think the role that scientists are playing in this pandemic has really brought to the fore, I think to the public, a, a realization of what actually goes on, you know, behind, say, the development of a vaccine or a drug or the understanding of, uh, of a virus. Because all around the world, you see scientists standing next to their heads of state and talking to the public and answering questions about this. So, I do think, yes, that the public is beginning to see the value of science and that countries are also uh, recognizing the, the importance of investing in science. And it's really good to see uh, in India, for example, uh, a coordinated uh, approach being taken, pulling together the expertise and resources that we have in our scientific establishments across the country, both in the public and the private sector, in order to address uh, a particular problem. For example, diagnostics. We, India was dependent on, on importing a lot of the reagents and things that go into making these diagnostics. And uh, from there, moving towards, you know, being able to be self-reliant uh, on that. And similarly, on, um, on vaccines as well. You need global collaboration, you know, in science, for sure. But also national collaboration and sometimes one tends to be in silos. So I think the lesson coming out of this again is investment in institutions, investment in science, encouraging more young people to go into science, providing career opportunities for them, and also and changing the ecosystem in a way that it's much easier to work with the public and the private sector. You see the, the NIH that uh, has the largest uh, budget in the world, 42 billion dollars of investment in R&D. Nobody can go close to that. But they also work very closely with the, the private sector because they realize that the academic uh, research then needs to be translated into a product which can only be done by the private sector. Of course, one can then discuss how you handle that intellectual property that's been developed by public investments in R&D. And I think there does need to be an open debate about how such intellectual property then actually works for public good again, because since it's public funds going into it. But having said that, there's no doubt that this collaboration between public and private is important. Institution strengthening and building is important. And, and again, that takes years. And I think the, the communication or dialogue with the public is, is really important. You know, and this is again, where transparency, of sharing information and sharing data is extremely important. So people actually understand what is happening, why it's happening, what's the rationale for certain decisions being taken and, and, and get a more nuanced understanding of uh, what's going on um, rather than being given you know, one way flow of information. I think a dialogue with the public actually raises the standards of science. And I think even in countries where there was a mistrust um, of institutions, surveys are showing that more and more the public are believing scientists and want to listen uh, to scientists. So I think that's a really good and positive trend. So on that note, uh, let me thank you, Dr. Smart, for your time and for your thoughts on this extremely important uh, subject. Thank you for participating in this web symposium uh, organized by the government of Kerala. I'm just a host of this. Uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ram. Thank you.